Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise Let us turn to the book of Colossians, chapter number 2, and verse, verses number 6 and 7. Certainly, uh, you know, I'm not the pastor, <laughs> so let's continue to remember him in prayer. Nothing like hearing your pastor, amen? amen. I'll admit that. Nothing like hearing from the pastor. But God knows, and, and uh, glory be to God, because it wouldn't be, um, you know, Pastor Johnson, I should say, is, is a great pastor and allows us to exercise our ministry. And the good news for the saints today that l we're, we're looking and hoping to hear from the pastor, well, I'm not going to give you a different doctrine than what he would give you. Because what I have, I got from him. He's my spiritual father in the gospel. And you say, well, you should be getting it from God. Well, God gave it to me through my pastor. And that's the order of God. And we also glean from those who he has gleaned from. He's, he's been gracious enough to give us all kinds of study material from Bishop Paddock and Bishop Herman and all these. And we, we make these, this information, this apostolic doctrine, a part of who we are. And uh, I heard one district elder say, we allow ourselves to be filled up. We come up, we pour out, we shut up, and we sit down. <laughs> so if you'll allow me to move through what it is that God has for us tonight, then I believe it will be in good hands. Amen. Amen. Tonight I want to talk about, so walk ye in him. In Colossians 2 and verses 6 and 7. As ye therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So the focus on our lesson tonight is that last clause of verse number six, so walk ye in him. And the lesson tonight not only deals with how we should walk, how we should live, that is, but there are also hints and we'll deal with here shortly um, on the Godhead, who Jesus is, who the Holy Ghost is, and, and such things like that, receiving the Holy Ghost. Um, however, the focus is on the attitude that we have when we receive Jesus Christ, when we, when we receive, in short, the Holy Ghost, and how we should never lose that sort of attitude. You know, I've heard it said before that when a, when a saint first gets saved, they're, you know, so on fire for the Lord and they start to taper down over time. Well, you know, the scripture talks about having a zeal but not according to knowledge. The more that we learn about God, the more that we experience about God, the more fired up we should be about God. Now, that doesn't mean that we should be shouting louder than, or harder than what we shouted when we first got saved, but our fervency for God should be growing, and, those, and the attitude that we had when we came to receive salvation, we should never lose that. Um, in verse 7, he says, rooted and built up in him. So we should keep the same attitude, and we should grow. That's what rooted and built up means, doesn't it? When a tree grows, it doesn't just grow up. If you didn't know, it also grows down. And the deeper roots it has, the harder it is to get out. I, I'm, I'm striving so that my roots go so deep, I don't care what the devil throws at me. He ain't getting me out of here. Amen? Amen? And I feel that the longer I'm saved. That you, like the song, like we sang on communion, you can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. What am I saying? I got some roots. I got something so deep, and God's got this thing so deep in me. I don't care if another if, if it, bishop... Well, whoever preaches a different gospel, an angel, let him be a curse. Because if you come to me with anything different than what I've gotten, I'm sorry, it's not matching up with the apostolic doctrine, and I've got some roots in me. And not only have I got some roots going down, but I've got some building up, which is going up. That's a, that's a complete spiritual growth right there. So, But as we're doing those things, as we're learning, as we're growing, we should never lose the attitude that it took for us to get saved. We should never lose that mindset. What it took for us to get saved, we have to keep that if we want to stay saved. Similarly, we teach that what it takes to get somebody saved, that's what it's going to be to keep somebody saved. So here we don't you know, make salvation about all of the excitement, all of the shout, all of the music, because if your salvation is solely based on the music, well, what are you going to do when you're on the job and you got somebody in your face telling you off? Then what are you going to do? So I had somebody do that to me uh, almost a year ago now. You know, stood in my face, cussing me out, threatening me. What do you think I was going to do? Hold on, let me get my James Cleveland out. What do you, what do you think I was going to do? No, but I had to have something in me. 
And so what it takes to get so if, as soon as if, if it took the excitement, if it took a bunch of um, I, and I'm trying to be respectful because I do think some, some of these people are as genuine as they can be. But if it took the excitement, if it took uh, the dramatic observance of people shouting all these things to get you saved, then if once that dies out, then out goes your salvation. But we preach holiness, we teach holiness, we preach Jesus Christ, we preach against sin, we preach repentance. And as I continue to hear, why do you think I keep saying those things? Because the same things that it took for us to get saved are the same things that it takes for us to stay saved. Amen? Amen. As ye therefore have received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk ye in him. So we are to continue to walk the same way that we received him. Now, that means if we're going to learn how we should walk, we need to take a step back and look at how we received him. Does that make sense? If you're supposed to walk how you received him, well, if you never received him, you can't do any walking. So let's look at that in the book of Acts, chapter number 3, and verse number 19. Receiving Christ Jesus the Lord. What does that mean, to receive Christ Jesus the Lord? You know, some, and before we read this, some people will say the whole, well, receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you shall be saved. That's nowhere in the Bible at all. Now, there is a scripture that they use in the Gospel of St. John that says, as many as did receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. But that was talking about the Jews, And that was talking about before Pentecost, because if you go back before that, the scripture says that he came to his own and his own received him not. And then he clarifies because there was a remnant that received him. And so then he says, but as many as did receive him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. What was that receiving talking about? Uh, I receive you, Lord. I'm a sinner that needs to be saved by grace. Amen. Now I'm saved. No, that's not what that's talking about at all. To as many as received him as the Messiah, when he came to his own, he came fulfilling the scriptures that was to show to them that I am the author and the finisher of your faith. Though a man uh, uh, die, if he believe in me, he'll live again. It was to prove to them who he was. And there was a small remnant that received him as that. And then he goes on to say, to them gave he power to become. So just because they received him doesn't mean they were the sons of God. It said that he gave, it meant he gave them a right to become the sons of God. And then he goes on and says, which were born. If you want to receive Christ, you have to be born again. And we're going to look at that here in Acts 3 and 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And we dealt with this the last time. Uh, we were teaching when we dealt with what should I expect from God. And well, when I, one of the things I should expect from God is for him to blot my sins out. But there are some requirements. If I haven't met God's requirements, I can't get God's benefits Amen. that he puts on those requirements. Let me give you an example. I don't know if this one will make sense or not. But um, w- one of the things that I do for my job is I collect water samples um, from people's houses particularly sometimes it's lead. You know, we'll be tender on that subject. Hallelujah. But when we collect those samples, you can't just go to somebody's tap outside their, their spigot there and just fill up a bottle and walk away. There are certain requirements that you have to meet before you can collect that sample. And one of the things that we do when we fill out, when we collect those samples is we have the residents fill out a form. And on that form, it's got all kinds of details on it. And I keep that form and I can submit it to the state when I submit to them the results from that sample. But if they come back and they say, you didn't meet the requirement on this form, they'll, they'll have to say your sample is invalid. So somebody comes to you and says, well, I'm saved, but they've never met the requirements of repentance. Their salvation is invalid. Does that make sense? If you, don't make, if you don't meet God's requirements, you don't get God's benefits. What is the benefit here? Your sins may be blotted out. What is the requirement? Well, first of all, you've got to repent. And then we also know that to have your sins blotted out, he said, um, in another place, uh, repent, or uh, uh, why tearest thou? Rise, be baptized, washing away thy sins. So, yes, there's also, there's also a need to be baptized, 
But I want to focus on the repentance here because if we don't repent, then our sins won't be blotted out. And that's like why we said last time, if somebody's baptized and they don't repent, they just go down a dry center and they come up a wet center. Because watch this, he tells you when their sins would be blotted out. Right after the comma, when, 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 that denotes a time. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The times of refreshing is receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. For with stammering lips and another tongue shall he speak to this people, saying, This is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. The stammering lips and the other tongue, the Holy Ghost, is the time of refreshing. And somebody's sins are blotted out when they've been baptized and received the Holy Ghost. Now, let me explain that a little bit more. Uh, John said it like this. There are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Agree in one what? One baptism. Without the water, the spirit, and the blood, you do not have the one baptism that's talking about on the front of this podium. That one baptism isn't just talking about water baptism. It's talking about the being born again, the the washing. That comes all through the repentance, the belief, the baptism in his name, and being filled with the Holy Ghost. We talked about requirements. The requirements for baptism are repentance and belief. And then when you're baptized, you're supposed to receive the Holy Ghost because the only requirements for a Holy Ghost are the same thing, repentance and belief. So let me, let me put it how the scripture says it. The scripture says dead things are formed from beneath the waters. So what does that mean? That means if somebody repents or dies to their, their self, dies to their sin, and we baptize them in Jesus' name, they're supposed to come up out those wa- that water speaking in other tongues. But when they don't, do you know why it is? It's because we buried somebody that was still alive. Baptism is like a burial. We are baptized with Christ in baptism. We are buried with Christ in baptism. So when we see all, and I don't mean this to speak against any church, but, you know, in in particular, but we'll see sometimes where they'll say, you know, we baptized 10 and two of them received the Holy Ghost. You know what that tells me? That means they buried eight people that were still alive. That's what that tells me. Brother Jeff liked that one. (laughs) I said that so I could take a sip of water. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. Um, at any rate, so the, Holy Ghost, so the Holy Ghost, what is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is the stamp of approval. So if, if they went down in the water and met the requirements of baptism, which was what? Repentance and belief. Then they'll come out speaking in other tongues because the requirement for receiving the Holy Ghost is what? Repent and be baptized, everyone of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive of the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if somebody hasn't already received the Holy Ghost and they come out of the water and they're not speaking in tongues, we need to take them down to the altar to do the thing that they should have done before they got baptized. They got to get their mind right sometimes. You got to give it over to the Lord, brother. You got to give it over to the Lord, sister. Now they should have done that before they got baptized, but hallelujah. Sometimes, Sometimes it took us some, you know, we weren't all, how many in here actually got, the, got baptized and then immediately right after received the Holy Ghost? Yeah, very, very few, you know. So sometimes we got to get our mind right. Amen. I, don't, I didn't mean that to put anybody in the spot, just making the point. Uh, when the times are refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, verse 20, and he shall send the Holy Ghost. Did I say anything wrong? <laughs> well, I read it wrong, <laughs> but it means the same thing. He shall send Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost. We're going to look at that here in a a moment. Um, But he shall send Jesus Christ. When somebody receives the Holy Ghost, they didn't receive one-third of God. They received Jesus Christ. Why do you think the scripture says, Christ in you, the hope of glory? Because the Holy Ghost has got a name, and it is J-E-S-U-S. The name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Look at this in verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the time of the restitution of all things. And that's the fulfillment of God's plan. So when we receive, uh, we're, we're dealing with receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. We receive the Lord Jesus Christ when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 
Let's look at another way that that's put in St. John chapter number 14 and starting with verse number 15. Amen? I'll wait for both of you to turn in your, your scriptures. <laughs> I say both because the majority look up at the thing. <laughs> say John 14 and verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. There is so much in this verse. So who is going to give the Holy Ghost? Well, here, here Jesus says the Father. But if you look at the next chapter, he says, um, I will send the, the comforter in chapter number 15. So is it Jesus or is it the Father? Well, Jesus is the Father. Now, why is the Bible written like this? The reason that the Bible is written like this in a way that might be confusing is because the Bible is written in a way to confuse the natural man. In Isaiah chapter 28, you can read that if you don't believe me. Uh, he says that line is up, should be upon line, precept upon precept, here little, there little, that they might fall back and be taken and snared. What does that mean, trapped? God wrote the scriptures in a way so that it confuses the natural man, so that those that don't want to know him, so that those that haven't been born again, they'll be trapped in the thinking that they understand God, but they're further away from God than had they had never read the Bible in the first place. God designed it like that. We say, well, we, we might not like that because we know that God wants everybody to be saved. Well, yeah, God wants everybody to be saved, but he wants everybody to repent. And if, we, and if you don't want to repent and come to God on God's terms, God's going to let you believe a lie. There's a script, you can read that in Isaiah chapter 66. I believe he says it there in a way to where he says, I'm going to choose their delusions. God will send a delusion your way if you don't want to believe the truth. If you don't want to repent, if, but if your heart is right, how do you say it? Seek and you shall find. If, if you want something from God, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. But if you don't want to know God, he'll let you think that you understand and you don't understand. So the majority of the world, they don't truly want to know God. The one scripture says the whole world lieth in wickedness. So then why are we surprised that the majority of the Christian world, quote unquote, believes the Trinity? They don't want to know God. They're lying in wickedness. They love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So what did he do? God hid himself from them. And he had the Bible, his word, written in a way to where they won't be able to understand it anyways. Did you know the only thing in here that, that is for the world is the gospel message? Everything else in here belongs to us. And it's hidden from the wise and prudent and revealed it unto babes. So the newest one that comes in, they, they get the Holy Ghost. They get the ability to learn and understand. And we teach the word of God and they're, and they're built up and they, they get weaned off milk and they start to eat some meat. And they can now rejoice because they know God. But the theologian that has never received the Holy Ghost but dedicated his whole life to studying the scripture, he's just as far away from God as he ever wanted to be. Amen. Even though he thinks he's right with God. But that's God's trap. Can we say amen? amen? And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. So again, we might think another. Does that mean that there's two or that there's three? No, it doesn't. And, we'll, and as we keep reading, we'll see why it doesn't. Jesus says that he was the comforter. Another, just, another here just means another form of the same comforter. Amen. One way we know that is because another implies that Jesus was a comforter. Anybody in here ever had Jesus comfort them? Anybody ever here have, have some problems and have somebody and have Jesus comfort them? What does comforter mean? Uh, comforter is a spinoff of, in the Greek, and you know, y'all, I don't try to get a whole lot of Greek and, and, and that sort of thing, but it is good for us to understand um, the gist of this word because comforter doesn't simply mean like how we would do it, like God just pats you on the back. You know, you got almighty God who can help you through your problem, and he just pats you on the back and says, Here, they're there, brother. That'd be, so, that'd be so lame, wouldn't it? That would be some cheap comfort, wouldn't it? It's going to be all right. We'll just rub you on the back. No, God doesn't give that kind of help. Here, I, I've, got, I've, got, I've got multiple definitions for the word comforter, okay? 
Comforter is someone that's called to one's side. The comforter is a lawyer. Remember, uh, the scripture says that his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. That's what that is, a counselor, the lawyer. Uh, com the comforter is the one that will plead your case. The comforter is the one that's by your side. The comforter is the intercessor. The comforter is also the consoler. He'll console you when you're going through the hard changes that we face in life. Amen? Amen. He, the, a comforter is an advocate, and a comforter is a helper. So an advocate, you know, my sister used to be what they call a family advocate. And so what would she do? Um, and if I'm wrong, sister, help me out afterwards. No, <laughs> I've talked to her about this before, specifically for this point, pre even before tonight. The, fa the family advocate, she would go in and help the homes of people that could lose their children to whoever it was, DHS. And so the family advocate would come in and help them straighten out their home so that the kids didn't get taken away. That's what God will do with your life. Life all kinds of confounded in sin. Like, you don't know which way is left. You don't know which way is right. We got some now that don't know if they're a boy, don't know if, if they're a girl. They must have forgotten how to look down. You know, we got, we, got some, we, got, we got all kinds of crazy people in this world. We not only do we have all kinds of crazy people, we got all kinds of people that are depressed and are turning to sin for consolement. But guess what? That booze is not the comforter. Your boyfriend is not the comforter. You know, we get people that they'll step out on their, on their marriage because they're looking for something to fill the empty void in their heart. So they step out on the one that they, that they said that they would love, that they would be there for, and, they'll, and to appease some sort of portion of them that they feel is missing or hurting or damaged, and they step out on the person, and it doesn't fill the void. It did them no good. It, hallelujah, I won't get into the deep. There might have been a few minutes where they thought it was doing some good. But afterwards, they got to look at the mess of the situation that they made in their life and realize this didn't do it. You know why? Because that was not the comforter. The drugs are not the comforter. You know, our, our hope, we got we to gotta stop building our hope on things that aren't going to last. Okay. If I can just put it like that. You know, I had, to get, I had to get my mind straight when I was so busy with this job, you know, I, who cares about that job? Who cares about what my title is in the company? Who cares? If, as long as I'm making ends meet, which God is going to take care of anyways, who cares about those things? Because when I get to glory, Jesus isn't going to call me project manager. What in the world? What's it going to matter if I was a, a, able to afford a multi-million dollar home on Diamond Lake or not? What in the world is any of that going to matter? But in this life, you know, there are some things that are worth more than money. What about your peace? What about your joy? What about knowing that there's a firm foundation in the midst of whatever mess and craziness you got going on in your life? Whole world turned their back on you. People coming at you unfairly, bringing you to court, getting sued from people, all kinds of crazy. Anybody ever in here ever have anything crazy to them happen in their life? Or is it just me? So we had some crazy stuff happen. But like the song said, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. I knew that I had God with me. Why? Because he's the comforter. That's what the comforter means. The comforter isn't just somebody that pats me on my back when I feel bad. You know, I've come in here late at night and it was just me just pouring out to God and God was here with me. But that's not all that the comforter is. The comforter has been with me through my life's ups and through my life's downs and speaking in my ear, so to speak. Now, don't make that anything weird like what I don't mean it. You know, the teaching that I've received would come to my mind and help me in the time of need. What was that? That was God being a comforter. For me, if you want help and you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're wasting your time out there. You need to get the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. I'll say that to all them out there in Bluetooth land, too. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ. So he said this. So anybody here glad they have the comforter? Amen. Amen. So that's what we're talking about. I'm trying to bring it back. I'll pray the Father. He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So the Holy Ghost will have forever. Does that mean... <laughs> You know, so now let me tell you what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean you get the Holy Ghost and you backslide and you still got the Holy Ghost. And just because you speak in tongues and you're backslidden doesn't mean you have the Holy Ghost. It just means you had the Holy Ghost. Now, God said what he meant, and he meant what he said. He would be here with us forever. And in another place, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
And we say that to people to help them when they're down and out, but that's not talking to the world. That's talking to his people. He never leave you, never forsake you, but if you've never been saved, you don't have him. Now, I thank God before I got saved, there was some mess that he kept me out of because he knew I would get saved. And, for, and because of simply his own goodness, there were some things that he kept me from. But never leave you nor forsake you belongs to the church. And that doesn't mean that if I get the Holy Ghost, I'll never lose the Holy Ghost. What that means is I can, when I receive the Holy Ghost, he's never going to walk out on me. He's never going to step out on me. But I surely can put him out. You know, I, if I look at um, Deacon Scott and I say, Deacon, you know, Deacon Scott and, and his wife were the first ones invited me to Christ Temple, by the way. I'll just throw that out there. You know, y'all been so good to me. Um, you know, let's say some tragedy happens and it's just poor old Chris living in the home. I'm going to move in with you. I'm going to help you out best I can. No, don't look like that now. <laughs> and, I, and brother, I love you in such a godly way that um, I'm never going to turn my back on you. I'm never going to leave you. Now, he can put me out if he wants to, can't he? But I told him I'm never going to leave him. So what am I going to do? I'm going to stand at the door and knock. And don't you remember the book of Revelation where he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Don't, think, don't y'all be laughing about Deacon Scott kicking me out of his house now. <laughs> kicking me in the curb. <laughs> I'll put your address out there, Deacon. No, <laughs> no Sister Scott will get me. <laughs> You know, so what, 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 is that, what does all that mean? You put those scriptures together. Sure, you get the Holy Ghost. You can put the Holy Ghost out by refusing the Holy Ghost, by rejecting God as he's trying to deal with you, and you put him out. And he'll just, and he, but he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So what will he do? He'll stand right there at the door and knock. He deals with the backslider, chastens them, lets the devil beat up on them, try, to try to get them to come to themselves like the prodigal son, trying to get them to realize the mess that they're in and that they were better off being saved, and he won't quit either. You know, one scripture says, now there's a scripture that talks about dealing with the rep- God turned them over to a reprobate mind. Over, you know, there are, there are instances where God, God will just deal with somebody, and you know, God, he will never leave them or forsake them, so he can, he can follow them right to the gate of the lake of fire, right to the gate of hell, but he won't go in there with them. And for us who don't put him out, he'll follow us. He'll be with us all the way till we get to the gates of heaven. Now it's up to us where I go, but God will never leave me nor forsake me. Amen? Amen. Um, And we'll keep reading here. Even the spirit of truth. We're talking about the Holy Ghost, who is also called the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Now, we talk about the spirit of truth. Don't you remember where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Who's the him? The spirit of truth. But ye know him. Oh, you, you disciples, you already know him. We know him, Jesus. Yeah, you know him. For he dwelleth with you. That's Jesus. And shall be in you. Jesus was with them. And then would be in them as the Holy Ghost, another form of the same comforter. Look at this in uh, in verse 18. He puts it plainly for anybody that's like, you're just making that up. Well, look at this. I will not leave you comfortless. I will send another person to you. No, I will come to you. Jesus has so much compassion for us that he didn't have to send anybody else. He came his own self. Didn't he say he was a jealous God? How is he going to be a jealous God and he sends somebody else to be in you? That doesn't make any sense. Just, see, that's deception. In verse number 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Jesus is the comforter and he's the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Whom the Father will send in my name. In my name. The Father will send him in my name. And then we read back in Acts, he said, he shall send Jesus Christ. How can he say he shall send Jesus Christ and here he'll say he'll he'll send the Holy Ghost in my name? Because the name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. So if you want the Holy Ghost, if you want the comforter, well, you better want Jesus Christ because that's who he is. Let's take a look at that in Matthew chapter 5. How do we receive the comforter? Because that's how we should walk. Isn't that what our focus verse said? As you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk ye in him. Is it, or am I just making that up? Yeah, y'all are just ready for fireworks. 
They, you know, they all look the same, really, right? I mean, come on now. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 1. Amen? And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and, he, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So this is breaking into a portion of the scripture we call the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus taught his disciples, which is something particular to note, on the mountain. And the first thing that he taught them was what we call these seven Beatitudes. Now, the Beatitudes are attitudes or disposition, a a mental attitude that somebody should have if they want to be all that God wants them to be. Why do I say it like that? Because the Beatitudes are God's seven stages. Or, uh, it's an ascending staircase to become the, the perfect man or the perfect woman, the perfect individual. God's picture of a perfect individual is painted by the seven Beatitudes. And each one of them, you cannot skip one to get to another one. Each one of them ascends up a staircase and you can't skip any steps now. You know, they say with a kid, you gotta, you got to teach them how to crawl before they walk, or sometimes you got to bring them back to learn how to crawl so that their development isn't messed up. Well, God, in, in the Beatitudes, he's not going to let you walk before you learn how to crawl. So if we're going to do it, it has to come this way. Now, the first two Beatitudes are the two Beatitudes it takes for somebody to get saved, for somebody uh, to receive Christ Jesus the Lord. Let's take a look at that. Now, and also keep in mind that these are the attitudes that somebody has when they repent. When we look at somebody, the only way we know that they were repented is if they received the Holy Ghost. But the whole time, God is looking at their heart, and this is what he sees. In verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This has absolutely nothing to do with being broke money-wise. Or we'd have a whole lot of people, that guy I just saw sleeping outside the other night would be blessed. But that's not what this is talking about. Blessed here is a type of euphoria, a type of happiness. And blessed are the poor in spirit. Not the poor in pocket, but the poor in spirit. What is poor in spirit? Poor in spirit is an attitude that I have. It's not, just, it, it's not an action. Poor in spirit will drive my actions. But poor in spirit is a condition of the heart, which God is primarily concerned about. When we read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus deals primarily with the heart. He takes the law from its outward actions and turns the focus to the heart. You've heard that it said of of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her in his heart. He's dealing with the heart. The poor in spirit is an attitude, something that's in my mind. It's a mindset, a poor mindset. And it's not talking about money poor. It's talking about a poor mindset of of this. Poor in spirit means I am acknowledging myself the way that God sees me. How does God see me? Well, I can't take a breath by myself. One scripture says that he giveth to all life breath in all things. I only have life because of God. Every breath I take is only because of God. Everything that I have is only because of God. And not only in a natural sense, but in a spiritual sense too. I have to recognize that spiritually, I have nothing that I can offer God. That's why we see Paul in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am. What was he being? He was being poor in spirit. Wretched, it, of a poor quality. That's what wretched means. Poor in spirit. That's what we're dealing with. So this first has to come by the preaching of the gospel. And that's why we have to to preach against sin. And that's why we have to preach Jesus. Because when we preach Jesus, I'm not comparing you with me. That's a mistake we often make. Well, I'm not as saved as Brother Christian because I don't study as much as Brother Christian. Or I'm not as saved as this one because of that. Or or here's the what people do possibly even more often is I know I'm saved because this one can't stop lying. But meanwhile, you can't stop backbiting. 
And so but what, what the gospel does when it's preached correctly is I take your eyes. Y'all ever have a dog that peed on the rug and you force its face to look, to look at the mess it's made? Or the kid that you're trying to discipline and they just won't look at you? And you're like, no, look at me right here. And that's what we're doing when we preach the gospel is we say, look at Jesus. Look at him. He did no wrong. You know, we say, we say that people were persecuted unjustly and so they went to jail for, for no reason. Well, maybe in a sense. But you can't point out a single soul to me that's been falsely imprisoned that they themselves haven't sinned. But Jesus never did anybody wrong, and they messed him up. They beat him beyond recognition, and he never did anything against anybody. He never did anybody wrong. He did no sin. There was no guile in his mouth. He lived holy. He didn't go around sleeping around with people. He wasn't gay. And we talk about people that are gay Christians, okay? You can't be gay and be a Christian because Christian means Christ-like. And Jesus wasn't no gay, okay? He wasn't transgender. He wasn't any of those things. So the preaching of the gospel, when it's done in, it, in the right spirit by somebody that's been called, prepared, and sent to preach the gospel, they are preaching the holiness of God and just how short that man, mankind falls, and part of the gospel is, is also saying, you can't do it on your own. Anybody in here ever tried being saved before they got the Holy Ghost? Amen. It just didn't work. You couldn't, you said, that's it, that's it. tomorrow I'm going to leave her. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> tomorrow I'm going to leave him. And, and there are some very tragic instances with that example. You know, people, people get stuck in abusive relationships. They don't have the power to get out. They're being manipulated. They're being controlled. They're, they're being um, fed lies. They're being fed empty promises. They're being manipulated. You know, but that's how, but it's not just that way with the abusive relationships. The devil will manipulate people that are in sin to do the very thing that they don't want to do. But he plays on their fallen nature and holds the carrot on the stick in front of their eyes and plays on that. And that's why the scripture says, in times past, you walked according to the prince of the power of the air. They're under the manipulation of the devil. And so that's why I realize I need the comforter. I need the helper. I need the advocate. I need somebody that can help me out of these situations. I need somebody that can help me out of sin. Now you say, well, I'll use AA. Well, fine. You might quit drinking with AA. But let me tell you something about AA, okay? <laughs> I'm a poet, and I didn't even know it. Yeah, it was corny. AA, sure, you might get through that program and stop drinking, but let me tell you something. It doesn't take it out your nature, and you can stop drinking, but AA cannot cleanse you of the guilt that you have on your conscience for the drinking that you already did. That guilt's going to follow you all the way, unfortunately, to the lake of fire. And so this is, and what, what does all this have to do with the lesson? This is what the gospel is of the kingdom of God is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring conviction to people to realize I'm guilty. It's supposed to bring conviction to people to make them realize I can't help myself out of sin. It's supposed to bring uh, conviction to people to realize how great God is and how nothing I am. Nothing, absolutely nothing. That is poor in spirit. Um, let, let's, let's take a look at that in Isaiah chapter number 66 in verse number 1. I'll say like Sister Lisa does, are you praying for me? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? All of these elaborate temples, you know, including the tabernacle in the wilderness, which wasn't as beautiful as what would come later with Solomon's temple. Um, or Herod's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, all of these other, these other buildings and edifices, these beautiful buildings. Well, which one of those are you going to put me in? Where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. Where is God's house? Well, if you look around, um, this is God's house. And I don't mean Christ's temple in Cassopolis. I mean Christ's temple, the people. Amen. This isn't Christ's temple. This is Christ's temple. 
And we are the, the temple of the living God. And you can read that in the Psalms where it says that God, the Bible said that God chose Zion for it. That's his church for his rest. We are the habitation of God. We are the spiritual house of God. But to this man will I look. I want God to look at me. You know, I want God's attention sometimes. You know, I want God to be with me. I want God's blessings on my life. And I'm not just talking about spiritual bless, natural blessings. I'm talking about spiritual blessings, too. I want to know God's got my back when I'm up against the devil. Amen? Amen. To this man will I look. So this is the attitude that you, gotta, that you have to have if you want God to look on you. If you want to be saved, you want to get God's attention when you're down here at this altar and you want him to fill you with the Holy Ghost, this is what you got to do. Even to him that is poor. We're talking about the poor in spirit recognizing I have nothing to offer God. You know, somebody, when they're, when they're hungry uh, enough, they're not going to say, I'll take that burger, to, but does it have pickles on it? <laughs> you know, the sister talked about her quarter pounder with no onion last night. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's fine. You know, I like the onion. But when you're hungry enough, you're going to eat the whole thing because you don't care what it is. You just need some sustenance. But people, when, when, you, when somebody comes to me and they say, I want to get saved, but you're not poor in spirit. You don't realize that you need God and just how little that you have. I want to be saved, but your church, see, that's somebody that's not actually poor in spirit. I want to get saved, but I don't want to have to give up the vape pen. I want to be saved, but I don't want to have to give. See, when, we, when, we, when people start making negotiations with God, they're not poor in spirit. When somebody's poor in spirit and you say and you go up to them, <laughs> you know, somebody's up on the so holding the sign at the, at the intersection, you know, we'll work for food or anything helps kind of thing. And you say, you know, I'm not, I won't give you any, any uh, money, but I'll buy you some food. And they say, nah, I'm good. There's, there's something wrong with that picture. <laughs> you must not be hungry. You must not be that poor. What do you mean you're going to turn down some food and you don't even have a dollar in that little cup that you're shaking? What are you talking about? Poor. So somebody that's poor spiritually realizes that I have none of my own righteousness. They come to God not just wanting the Holy Ghost, but realizing that they need the Holy Ghost. And of a contrite spirit. The contrite here is, is somebody that's deeply affected with grief or sorrow. They're, they're crushed. They're, they're a humble person. And trembleth at my word. Now that doesn't mean that, you know, Brother Christian's up here preaching and you're sitting back there shaking. <laughs> That's not what that's talking about. You know, I'm not that scary. I know I got a big head, but I'm not that scary. <laughs> Trembleth at my word is somebody that, who has a reverence for the word of God. How do I reverence the word of God? How do I show him reverence? Well, when I show the, let me say it like this. God, when he speaks, there is no negotiating. When God speaks, he means what he says. And sometimes our actions show that we don't actually believe that God means what he says. God says holiness, and we want to give him righteousness. God says, be ye holy, and we say, I'll be ye faithful to church. Now, do I need to be faithful to church? Yeah, but it should come out of a heart of holiness. When I, when I put other people's opinions over what God says, I'm not trembling at his word. When I put my own ideas about what it means to be saved above what comes across from this pulpit when it's out the word of God, that's not trembling at um, the word of God. That's not trembling at his word. The individual that trembles, that reverences the word of God, is paying attention in Bible class and is saying, you know what, I've got other things going on in my life, but this is the thing that's most important right now. I'm not going to reverence my job or the drama that's going on at work over the word of God. And when they leave here, they might hear other opinions. You know why? Because don't you know that sometimes the fowls of the air come to see where they can snatch up the word? And if we haven't let it been embedded in our heart, the fowls of the air aren't literal birds. Those are the people with a second opinion. The devil will send somebody, a loved one, a family member, a spouse, a whatever, to say, that's what you say at your church, but that's not the only way. That's a foul of the air. And any time that I esteem, any time that I listen to a foul of the air above what's coming out the word of God, I'm not trembling at his word. So the sinner that comes to be uh, repent and to be baptized to tarry, to tarry at this altar, if they haven't gotten the Holy Ghost coming out the water, they have to tremble at his word. He says, I need to receive the Holy Ghost. Receiving the Holy Ghost, I will do. 
He said, I need to repent. I'm going to repent. And now even so, going forward, didn't he say, didn't, he say, didn't we say this in, in our lesson? As you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk ye in him. I should never lose this attitude. This is the point of the lesson. To get the Holy Ghost, it takes being poor in spirit. To get the comfort of the help that I need, it takes being poor in spirit. And I should never lose that attitude. When I came, when I, you know, like, like, like we say, I came to Jesus weary, worn, and sad. I found in him a resting place. He has made me glad. But some, how come some of us lose that mentality the more we've been saved? Now, we might say, well, I'm still poor in spirit, but I've got four questions here, and these are not all encompassing by any means. But these are just four questions to provoke thought on just how poor in spirit we are. Question one. And I'm not looking for any answers. Please, no hands or anything like that. This is just something to, re to make us reflect. When was the last time I prayed about a big life decision? You know, how many, how many big life decisions have we faced and we just jumped out there and, and did what we thought was best for the family or did what we thought was best for our career? How many, how many times, when was the last time in one of those moments I stopped and prayed and asked God, Lord, this seems right, but you can see what I can't see. What is that saying? Here's something about prayer. Prayer is telling God that I'm dependent on him. It's telling God that I'm poor in spirit. I realize that I don't have the intelligence, no matter how big my degree, to make my life decisions for myself. So that's the question. When was the last time I prayed about a big life decision? Question two. When was the last time I sought the scriptures about a big life decision? So it's not just praying and I prayed, that now I can do it. <laughs> no. What does the scripture say about it? You know, there was an instance that just happened for me, um, and I'm not trying to make it about me, but let me use this for an example. You know, there was an instance where I got an opportunity to pick up a second job, making good part-time money. I'm like, man, this would be a good deal. I can use my water license here and make some good part-time money, and I prayed about it. And the scripture came to my mind, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath called him to be a good soldier. What did that mean for me in that moment? I, I didn't need the extra money. I would, I would have just been entangling myself with the affairs of this life, getting so involved with this world that it would have been draining my time that I could have had studying the word of God. I'm a minister. I've got responsibilities. I'm a dad. I've got responsibilities. I'm a servant. That's what minister really means, but I'm a servant in the church. You know how guilty I'd feel if I just dropped my service to this church and, and only preach behind the pulpit? What in the world? What kind of minister would I be? Oops, I didn't mean it like that, y'all. I'm talking about me, okay? <laughs> you know, God, God knows, and, and you got to work with your pastor. And I'm not the pastor. I don't mean that by any means. But what I'm saying is this. You know, God brought that scripture to my mind, and I said no to that job. I called them back um, and, and said I can't take it. I'm sorry, I'm not interested. Here is somebody's number that may be interested. So I tried to help them out so turn them on to someone else. And would you believe that I opened a Bible class from District Elder Dorian Richardson, and the first verse that he quoted in that Bible class was that same verse? And would you believe it wasn't too much longer that Sister Lori got up and preached just a few weeks ago from that same verse? So we should be looking to the scriptures for the God. And thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. But when we get so caught up in, well, this is, I know this is going to be a good decision. You don't know if it's going to be a good decision. In your mind it is, but somebody that's poor in spirit recognizes, I cannot guide my own life. It's by God. God is the source of my strength. God is the strength of my life. God is my guide. God is my helper. And he knows the end from the beginning. So he may be able to see something down the road that I have no idea on. So that was question two. When was the last time I sought the scriptures about a big life decision? Question number three, when was the last time I sought God about my behavior at work, at home, or at church? You know, when we assume I'm just living holy, or we assume that we're doing all that's right. But here, here's the thing, and I don't mean this to say that God won't let you know when you're doing wrong, because he will. But we can get so wrapped up in, in our daily lives, we can get so wrapped up in assuming that we treated somebody right, that we never stop to examine ourselves. And that is a violation of the scripture because the scripture says examine yourselves uh, uh, daily. You know, we should be looking at ourselves and taking inventory. Did I handle this situation right? 
when this person came to me and said something crazy, did I really get the victory? I'm not talking about overthinking like, like some of us have, and, and I've been guilty of. I'm not talking about overthinking. I'm talking about lining up my behavior with the word of God. Do I treat my boss right? Do I treat my coworkers right? Do I treat the saints right? Do I treat myself right? Do I treat my spouse right? So that if somebody doesn't ask those questions, what are they saying? I've got it. I got this. And one scripture says, um, if any man thinketh he stand, let him take heed lest he fall. We stand by faith. So it's not, we shouldn't ever just be thinking, I got it. We put no confidence in the flesh. And we are, we're human. We're bound to make mistakes. So we should be searching the scriptures, praying, God, search me. God, help me. Help me, help me remember. Did I do this situation right? And you know, God will, the scripture says he'll bring all things to your remembrance. So if we, we, when we pray, I'm not saying we should be sitting there waiting to hear a voice from heaven, but we should pray and expect to receive something from God. Now, it may not always be in that moment. Sometimes it'll be from across the pulpit. And as a matter of fact, it's going to be something that you've been taught from across the pulpit. You know, God will bring those things to your remembrance and help guide you in your life. That's why he's teaching us from the word of God. It's not so that we can just explain every verse in the Bible. That's not what this is. This is the word of God is for is for multiple purposes. One purpose is of faith unfeigned. Um, and one 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 purpose is of a good conscience. I want to have a conscience that's clear between me and my fellow man. I want to have a conscience that's clear between me and my God. And how am I going to ever make sure that I'm ready for the rapture if I never look at myself to be ready? The scripture says that his bride hath made herself ready. That takes work. So this question takes work. But it's saying, God, I'm not just going to assume I'm right. I want to know, do I line up with your word? Is the way that I'm treating people and interacting with people based on truth or is it based on how I was raised? Is it based on how I believe or is it based on your word? Question number four, the last question before I get stoned, is how highly, how highly have I placed God in the things of God as a priority in my life? If I realize I need God, you know, when you realize you need something, you're right there to get it, aren't you? You know, the person that, that's, that's truly hungry, they'll be, there, they'll be there in the line when it's time to hand out the food. You won't have to chase them down to give them something to eat, will you? You know, the person that actually wants a job, they'll be there at the interviews, won't they? <laughs> See, that's why, I, you know, when I used to interview people with this job, you know, and this, isn't, this is just natural, this isn't spiritual at all. But, you know, I'd, I'd interview people on these Zoom calls, and they'd just be wearing T-shirts and whatever else, and I'm like, or they'd be, like, in their, in their garage or something like that, leaning in and out. Like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> Do you not want this? Do you actually not want this job? You know what I mean? You know, you see people, that makes me think of the people that do the, the Zoom calls on court. They had that one guy that was driving, and he didn't get a suspended license or didn't even have a license or something like that. It's crazy. But what's, what's the point? Y'all made me forget my point. No, I remember the point. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> the, the, point is, the point is, when you, when somebody really believes they need a job, they're going to be there on time for the interview. When somebody's hungry, they're going to be there in line for the free food. Right. Hallelujah. You know, Brother Delshawn, we're having a fire at our house tonight. Amen. Shameless plug. You know, and we're just having hot dogs, nothing fancy. But, you know, Minister Wicker asked uh, Minister Scott over there, Alex Scott, are you going to go to the fire tonight? And, you know, Minister Scott said, well, there's going to be free food, so I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, he doesn't need the food, you know. But, but when, you, when you need something, when you actually need, when there's something that you realize you are in N-E-E-D of, you need it, you're going to be there to get it. And when I'm poor in spirit, I have now realized that I need God. And this is an attitude that I should never drop off. I should never, ever stop feeling like I need God. Amen? But don't you know in, in uh, Revelation, the church of Laodicea, thou sayest, I'm rich and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. So walk ye in him. So walk ye in him. Why, why did we lose that, the poor in spirit? How do I know the church of Laodicea? How do I know the Bible's true when it says we say that we're in need of nothing? 
you know, the least attended service in, in church, not just here, but in you know, many places, is prayer service. Prayer. Hallelujah. How do I know? Because I'm up here leading prayer at 630. <laughs> That's everywhere. And I, know, and I know some people can't make it, so please don't take that any, any which way. But just making the point. Um, that, that's, that's how it is. Amen. And what is that saying? If we believed that the rapture was going to happen today, would we have made it to, tonight? Would we have made it to prayer service? I need him. Just like the children of Israel, when their backs were against the wall, so to speak, when they were, when they were closed in between the, the, the sea there and, and the Egyptians coming after them, they needed something from God. That's the time we live in. We live in a time where we're surrounded by false prophets. We live in a time where the church is off. Now, God has a church within the church that's going to make it. So don't think that every individual in the church is off. But the church as a whole, the entity that's supposed to give the ministry, the help to the world that the world needs, that institution is being corrupted. I need God. I, I, and I've got to pray. I've got to fast. Now, you might say, well, the scripture doesn't say we have to fast. Well, some faith doesn't come but by prayer and fasting. Hello. You know what I mean? Amen. And that fast, what we have for consecration, that helped me. Amen. And I've been fasting since. And I've seen God help me grow in ways. I need God to help me grow. When I find out there's something in me that I'm having trouble overcome, I don't sit back. I don't fall back and say, um, you know, that's it. I guess I, this is just all I am. I'm going to be in the backside of the pew. No, I say, God, I need you. And I don't just say I need you. I show him I need him. I show him I'm poor in spirit. How do I do that? By praying, by fasting, by coming to Bible class, by asking questions, by, by tracing the scriptures to try to get something put in me. So when the devil comes, I've got God's help. And I've been investing into my soul. See, but when, I, when I'm a part of this church age with that mindset of I don't need anything, well, of course I don't pray. Of course I don't fast. Of course I don't search out the scriptures as it's been taught. You know, we start, people come up with their own things. Why? Because they don't realize how in need of something they are. They've got the message. But that's not how it's supposed to go. I didn't just make this stuff up. You know why? Because I know that I need him. I, don't, I can come up here and give the most eloquent speech in the world, and y'all will be like, it, it, I'm not saying you would, but some may, might say, oh, brother, that was so good. But God wasn't with me a word of it. I need the anointing. You need the anointing. Let me say it like this. You don't need, brother Christian, you need the anointing that's going to come through the word of God, regardless of who God sends to do it. We need him, and we can't lose that. So walk. That's what it took to get saved. That's what it took to stay saved. Now, the other one was, blessed are they that mourn, which is just expressing an attitude of repentance. So my attitude has to, the, same, the very things that I set down to come to be saved, my attitude, my pride, my life, the sin, the, the unsaved girlfriend, hallelujah. I don't pick up those things now that I've been saved. You know, the scripture talks about Stephen uh, when he was preaching that sermon before he got stoned. He talked about the children of Israel returned to Egypt in their hearts. You know, I could be sitting in the pew and my heart's back in Egypt. Those things that I had to let go of to set, to set down to be saved, the attitude of dependence on God that I had when I got saved, we need to have that if we're going to make the rapture. Amen. God is soon to come. Very, very soon. Like, the, like that song said, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Anybody still believe that? And if you don't hear any mention of that, you know it's the last days. <laughs> no, I like saying that one. No, but, but those, those attitudes, we can't lose that. We're supposed to take those attitudes and grow in that. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for dismissal.